Um, yes, so I'm going to be talking about um, a topic of downscaling or super resolution, which has come up briefly already, and I think a couple of people will be discussing. So that makes my life slightly easier for introducing it. Um, and I'm going to specifically be talking about a synthetic downscaling task um, for wet world potential temperature over the UK. Um, and looking at going from roughly synoptic or mesoscale to convective scales um, of about one to two kilometers. And as has already been mentioned, this is an, in some sense an ill-posed problem and one that it makes sense to handle probabilistically or with a generative model. Possibly the approach I'm going to describe or the uh, approach I've chosen to take might be slightly different to what some of the other people will be discussing um, in that I've decided to look into how far you can get by treating this really as a mathematical or statistical question and so to see how far you can get using the problem structure itself uh, without really having much of a training set. Um, so that has some advantages in terms of not needing so much training, um, although some disadvantages as I'll discuss later on. And the underlying model that this is based on is Gaussian random fields or you might be more familiar with Gaussian processes. This is essentially exactly the same thing, but applied to two dimensional data that represents a geospatial field, has a different name of Gaussian random fields. And I'll just give a brief introduction to these in case anyone is unfamiliar. So essentially a Gaussian random field is just a type of Gaussian distribution. And you can, you'll be familiar with these from, from lessons on wherever. Um, so a one dimensional one of these, just a normal distribution is defined by its mean value and also its variance around the mean that describes the uncertainty in some way. Um, a two dimensional Gaussian distribution um, is slightly more complex. Again, it's defined by its mean, which now is a two dimensional vector and also its covariance, um, which now as opposed to in one dimension is a slightly more complex object as a matrix, which describes both the variance of each dimension individually and also their covariances on the off diagonals. So how much one is going to vary with the other. And the way you get from these to Gaussian random fields, it's really about the structure of the covariance. Um, so in one dimension with a, with a Gaussian process, uh, the covariance is having this kind of diagonal peak that then uh, gradually drops away. And that encodes the spatial structure of one dimension, but we expect points that are close to each other to be more highly correlated or have a higher covariance. Uh, compared to those that are distance, which might be essentially unrelated. And so you can see an example covariance in the top right and samples from several different Gaussian processes with different length scales. So these would be um, different shapes of the covariance matrix. Um, on the left, it would fall away very quickly. Uh, so it would be quite a narrow peak. Um, whereas on the right, a much smoother field described by a, a longer length scale. And going up to two dimensions, just down below, we get Gaussian, Gaussian random fields. And the covariance structure in this case is a little more complex when looked at as a matrix, but essentially is doing exactly the same thing, but this time in two dimensions. So. Um, pretty much any point in the Gaussian random field is going to be highly correlated with its immediate neighbors and their immediate neighbors. And then that, uh, that connection drops off the further away you move. And so just in the, just as in the Gaussian process case, um, I've shown some different kinds of uh, length scale and spatial structure for the Gaussian random fields that you can get using different covariance matrices. Um, being 
essentially probability distributions. These models have some of the standard operations that you can do with probabilistic models. In particular, you can condition on data points. So if you have observed your data, and this is used quite a lot in Gaussian processes for, for function emulation, um, if you've observed um, a value at a particular point, you can condition on that value and get a posterior distribution using linear algebra. Um, and then you have a, a new kind of probability distribution that encodes this information. Likewise, um, I've mentioned the length scale and there can be other parameters that describe these distributions. And there's a pretty simple, again, linear algebraic way of finding the log likelihood of these parameters based on data. And so we can do kind, some kind of um, inference for these parameters. And finally, if we have one of these distributions, we can sample from it uh, simply by taking the mean and then convolving some kind of white noise by the square root of the covariance matrix, or in practice, probably using the cheaper Cholesky decomposition. And so how can this be applied to downscaling? Well, it turns out that it is quite directly applicable. And the reason is that as long as we're treating the Gaussian case and everything comes down to a Gaussian distribution, the covariance is linear and everything can be treated linearly. And this, what this actually means is that just the same as previously I mentioned, we can condition on point values of the field. So we've made an observation at a particular point. We can also um, condition on spatial averages or linear combinations of these. And so this allows us to have a way of conditioning on a low resolution field and getting a posterior distribution for a higher resolution version of the field. And just to give you some example of um, the difference between this and the conditioning on particular points, I've just shown a simple one dimensional example. So on the left, I've showed uh, conditioning on some point values and then drawing samples from that posterior distribution below. And you can see that at each point, um, each of the samples goes through the point that we've conditioned on as expected. On the right, I've used the same data, but instead of treating them as point observations, I've treated them as spatial averages. And you can see that the posterior distribution is somewhat different. It doesn't collapse down to points but it has a more even, even variance. And in the samples below, it's no longer the case that all of the samples are constrained to go precisely through the points of the red dots. It's a little harder to see what the conditioning has done, um, but by taking the same spatial averages of all of the samples, you can see in the dark green line, that's actually all of the spatially conditioned samples. So they're all essentially agreeing on the spatial averages, whereas the light green lines show the ones that have been conditioned on point values. So they're not constrained by this, by this spatial average and give different answers. And just as a point of interest, I've shown the um, posterior covariance matrices, and you can see these are also quite different. Um, in the in the case of conditioning on points, there's this sort of dipole structure of positives and negatives around the points that we've conditioned on, which I think of being encoding smoothness through that point. So if it's higher on one side of the conditioned point, it's likely to be lower on the other side, just purely for, for smoothness reasons. Um, whereas on the right, there are these, these larger scale negative values which are in some sense saying that it has to maintain this spatial spatial average at a particular value. So if we have a high value in one place within the same kind of block, that will bring the other values down. And all of this relies on us having an 
our covariance matrix to start with. So once we have some kind of description of the high resolution covariance, we can then get a covariance to describe the low resolution covariance and some intermediate ones, but we need to have something to start with. And this is actually quite important for this application because because I'm targeting convective scales and the structure of fields at this scale can be quite variable depending on the prevailing weather regime. Um, this covariance kind of encodes that structure that's missing when we look at the, at the coarse grained version. And so how I'm treating this is to estimate the length scale of that by maximum likelihood again on the coarse resolution field. Um, so yes, essentially it's using this one low resolution field and getting a length scale and then using that to infer this posterior distribution. Um, and that's what I just said. So yes, we start with this low resolution input, estimate the covariance length scale, and then use that length scale to condition on the input. And then we have something we can draw high resolution samples from. And so I've done an experiment on some model data. This is, as I say, wet bulb potential temperature from the MoGreps UK model. And I've looked at synthetically um, coarse grained versions of this and trying to draw samples that capture some of the spatial characteristics of the original um, from four by four coarse graining and then shown there eight by eight coarse graining. And so in the eight by eight case, um, the results were pretty good. Um, I've, I've reported on the mean squared error. So this is kind of a point by point verification, um, which I wouldn't particularly expect it to do so well on the samples um, because of this problem of stochasticity. And then on the right, on the, in the middle column, there's a, power spectral density. So this is somehow reporting the spatial structure of the field as a whole. And then on the right, there's a sort of intermediate metric of based on neighborhoods. And so the model that I've described, the GRFT model has performed the best overall. Um, the samples performing better on the two spatial verification metrics. Um, but not so well on the mean squared error and the mean of the distribution performing pretty well on the mean squared error. Uh, the results are actually less good, perhaps surprisingly, for the 4 by 4 case. Um, the model still performs pretty well overall, but particularly in the neighbourhood score, um, the samples seem to be underperforming. I think part of the reason for this is that this model assumes spatial stationarity of the field. So essentially having the same um, length scale everywhere to describe the whole field. But in the actual atmosphere, this isn't really the case. And so have in cases where there are sort of sharp gradients in one part of the field that can kind of bleed into places where it should be smoother. So this is something for future work. Um, but yes, this doesn't seem to affect so much the synoptic scale experiment. So this is uh, definitely a work in progress. So there's some ongoing work to do. But just to recap, it's a stochastic or generative model based on a probability distribution. It's using Gaussian random fields, which are a very established way of hand handling probability, although using them in a slightly non-standard way to do with spatial averaging. And it's pretty much a mathematical model that requires essentially no training, perhaps a bit to choose the hyperparameters of the model. Um, there's ongoing work, as I say, to figure out how to handle this spatial non-stationarity that was affecting the four by four results. And also a couple of other extensions. So anisotropy where things are different in different directions, which can be very realistic. Um, and also for handling non-Gaussian variables. 
as well as improving the speed currently, um, computation Lewis is limited to relatively small fields. And so some of the things I'm thinking about here are how to kind of tactically um, incorporate parts of more data-driven machine learning or how to um, get these things to speak to each other. So translating this into more of a more of a deep learning framework. I think there's actually quite deep similarities between the two, although it's not entirely obvious at first sight. Um, and we're writing this up at the moment, so this is currently in review. And I think that's all from me. Thank you for listening.